What I'm going to talk about this evening is um, I'm, I'm going to talk about two or let's say two and a half myths, two and a half, because the third myth that I'm going to talk about is really um, arguably part of the first myth that I'm going to talk about. So two myths, three myths, two and a half myths, um, as you like it. Um, these myths, if you have familiarity with psychoanalysis, which given the name of this institution, I imagine many of you do, um, you will be familiar with these myths already. Um, but what I'm going to try and do is very quickly, if we need to, sketch over the myths as they are originally presented in Freud, and then look at how Lacan adapts them. Um, and when I say look at how he adapts them, the emphasis there is really going on, on the how. And it's the how that I'm really interested in, because that move that Lacan makes with these initial two myths is, I'm arguing, essentially part and parcel of the same move and put together allows us, in conjunction with the third myth, which is really part and parcel of the first myth, allows us to start to think about questions of um, I'm struggling with terminology here, so I'm just going to go through the terminology first, because the, the title of the talk is, um, well, the title of the talk is um, intentionally provocative and probably not hugely representative, so if you want to leave now, please um, feel free to leave now and get your, your money back. Um, in contemporary society, at least in English, and um, I'm afraid I've not done my homework, so I'm not sure exactly how these things are um, expressed in German. But in English, there's a, a contemporary debate is the wrong word. I mean, for want of a better word, I would say debate. It's not really a debate because the two sides of the supposed debate don't talk to each other. And that's not really a debate. And that's part of what I'm trying to address um, this evening. Um, but there is, let's say, for want of a better word, a debate between the use of the term sex in terms of biological sex and gender. Uh, the use of these two terms in English has been comfortably, you know, they've comfortably cohabited for, for many, many years. Um, the idea of sex referring to a biological description and gender referring to a social or a socialized description has been something that's been widely accepted in social theory for, for decades. But recently, this distinction has come under fire. And there's a lot of people who um, are keen to blur the distinction between the two, use the two terms um, interchangeably, and use the two terms interchangeably, arguably, in order to disrupt the debate, and the, the, the very live debate that's going on um, in many societies across the world now around um, issues of um, biological sex, um, sex identification, um, and gender. So to use the word sex seems to kind of fall on one side of that debate. I don't really mean to do that. It re really was a title chosen to be slightly provocative, playing on the other um, dual meaning of sex. Um, which I'm not really going to talk very much about tonight. I'll touch on it very briefly. But really what I'm trying to focus on tonight is this idea of what Lacan calls sexuation, um, which is maybe a slightly more helpful term because it allows us, and again, this is part of the, the aim of the work I'm talking about tonight, is to move away from that um, sclerose debate between sex and gender that doesn't really go anywhere. It's become solidified into two opposing perspectives that can't find any way to communicate. Um, so the idea of sexuation that Lacan refers to is um, gives us a third way, a third possibility. Um, okay, do you want to roll on? Okay, so myth one. Okay. So myth one is Oedipus. I think we're all... I imagine familiar with the myth of Oedipus, um, the story of Oedipus, most famously captured by Sophocles. In very simple terms, tells the story of a, a child, baby, who is abandoned, supposedly um, left for dead, but who doesn't die, um, who receives an oracle of foretelling that he is going to kill his own father and um, marry his own mother. Um, in an attempt to escape this fate, he leaves his adopted parents and his adopted home, um, unaware that um, 
is not leaving his real parents and his real home, and therefore is not leaving, but actually proceeding towards his foretold destiny. Um, and on the road, he, unbeknownst to himself, meets his father. Um, he gets into an argument with his father and ends up killing him. Proceeds on his way, ends up in Thebes, where he defeats the um, the Sphinx. And as a reward for defeating the Sphinx, who's been holding the, the town in siege, um, he is uh, rewarded with the throne of the city, uh, which means marrying um, the recently widowed queen of the city, who happens to be his mother, although, again, he doesn't know this. But that's the basic story um, in Sophocles, as you are probably all also where Freud takes this myth um, and argues that this myth, well, he argues this myth has resonated through our society so um, for so long and so forcefully because there's something in the myth that speaks to all of us. And that's Freud's arguably rather um, dubious grounds for taking the Oedipus myth and, and generalizing the Oedipus myth and saying the Oedipus myth applies to all of us. And from this, Freud develops, from this in conjunction with his, um, his case studies, his own work on psychoanalysis, Freud develops um, the famous Oedipal complex, or the theory of the Oedipal complex, which just follows Sophocles' story. So the Oedipal complex for Freud is that the child um, is in a, the child, we'll put it in very simple terms, the child is an amorous or um, Essential relationship with the mother, which you, know, you take out words like sex, is actually a much more acceptable way of putting it. And seems actually quite um, understandable. Babies are very close to the mothers. They like physical contact with their mothers. They are attached to the mothers. They're literally, physically, biologically attached to the mothers at the point of birth. So we have this moment of union um, at the beginning, and that union is then broken. And Freud um, supplements this idea of the Oedipus myth with, as I say, reference to case studies, most famously the little hands um, study where um, there seems to be a much more sexualized um, idea of between the, the child and the mother, not consummated sexual relationship with the child and mother, but you know, this kind of um, sensualized relationship or at least desire, and it's the father who intervenes. So this is the basis of Freud's myth. So the baby wants to have uh, the mother, and that relationship is broken by the intervention of the father. And we can read into that what we want. There is some, yeah, in some senses, the myth makes some kind of sense out of that relationship. So I say children do tend to begin in some kind of um, close, um, sensual, physical proximity to the mother. And you know, at some point, presumably most fathers will um, intervene to, to separate that, or at least that would be the child's perception. So you have here what um, is referred to as the Oedipal Triangle, the child, the mother, and the father. If we think about this logically, if we take Freud's um, telling of the story um, as fact, if you didn't have the father in the picture, then the child would be stuck in this relationship with the mother in perpetuity, yeah. And with, as nice as our mothers may be, you don't want to be simply stuck in that relationship with your mother. The, the, the course of human life is to leave the mother to go off into the world and have other relationships and you know, um, the existence of the human race in some ways kind of depends on it. One issue and there probably are many issues with Freud's um, theory, and um, there certainly are many issues with Freud's theory. One obvious issue is because the trajectory of the evil complex for Freud is this, it's trying to describe how we achieve this separation, which results in the possibility of other relationships. So um, take the example of the boy, which is the classic example that Freud uses to develop myth. The boy is in an amorous relationship with the mother. That needs to be broken. It needs to be broken by the intervention of the father in order for the boy to then go on and find replacements for the mother. And the replacements of the mother are going to be other people who in some way resemble the mother. Now, it might be they resemble the mother in characteristics. It might be they resemble the mother um, physically. They look like the mother. The very base resemblance is the fact that it's another woman. 
So the boy goes off and finds another woman. Now, immediately we see there what Freud's describing is a heteronormative perspective on, on human sexual relationships or human amorous relationships. It's also focused on the boy. And it kind of makes some sense when you focus on the boy. You think, okay, yeah. if we accept the heteronormative society that Freud lived in at the time, then this would have been normal, heteronormal. Um, boys would need to leave the mother in order to go out into the world to find another woman to marry, to have children, and hence um, society, the human race, continues. It doesn't work quite so well to explain what goes on for the girl child. Because if you follow Freud's logic, then the girl would also need to be separated from the mother and then would also look for a mother replacement. Um, and then we're in a position that's not quite so heteronormative and doesn't explain um, the continuation of the human race that Freud is trying to explain here. The Freud struggles to find an alternative here. Um, his colleague Jung put forward the idea of an electric complex, so find a, a different Greek myth that kind of mirrors the Oedipal complex, but from the female perspective. Freud rejects this. And what he does is he takes the Oedipal complex and he just he puts a twist into it. So it puts a twist focused around the notion of castration, which we'll come to shortly, um, which allows him to argue then that the, the girl child eventually ends up um, in some kind of identification or attachment to the father, which is then subsequently broken. So it's more complex for girls eventually. And it's arguably only more complex for girls because Freud had started from a particular theory which was already male-focused, and he had to then find a twist to accommodate um, the female perspective, which makes the theory more complicated, and then subsequently the reality he's trying to describe um, more complicated too, which seems a little bit convoluted. What Lacan does is he takes Freud's theory, and he's very aware of the, the problematics within Freud's theory. And he takes the basis of the theory. He doesn't jettison it. He doesn't say, okay, this is just a nonsense theory. He kind of takes a little bit of critical distance from it. But he holds on to the basis of the theory, and he replaces the key parts of the theory with non-people, let's say. Um, he takes the theory and he abstracts it. So where in Freud, we're talking about the child, the mother, the father. As I say, it's heteronormative. It's assuming that um, we have a nuclear family in play here. And a lot of Freud's work does assume a nuclear family where you know, there always seems to be uh, multiple um, children. There always seems to be children of different sexes. There's a brother and a sister, um, and there's a mother and a father. It doesn't accommodate some of the families that we might see in the 21st century where uh, there isn't a mother and a father, or you know, there's only one parent. Um, or there are, there are more than two parents, or there are two parents of the same sex, or identifying as the same sex. So there are different um, combinations which would allow us to understand family, which is simply not accommodated in this model. Lacan, in abstracting it, simplifies it in a way, um, which helps us understand the, the bare bones of what's going on for its theory, which I think is a useful move that he makes. If we can, just move on, sir. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. So in Lacan's version, rather than the mother, we take to this, there is another person. So we can think of this as primary caregiver. Yeah, so there is for the child, in order for the child to survive, we are being kind of pragmatic about it, there needs to be someone else. There needs to be someone else. It doesn't need to be a singular someone else, but there needs to be another position other than the child. But there is very rarely going to be simply a dual relationship. There's always going to be something else. Uh, in Lacan, this something else doesn't need to be the father. It doesn't need to be a second mother. It doesn't need to be a human being at all. It simply has to be something that is not the mother figure, I put M back in here because um, for want of a better word, we can call this caregiver um, the mother of some sort. So Lacan's point is there's always something else. And he labels this something else. He uses three 
terms variably to talk about this, or two, but one of them already contains two terms. So first of all, he calls it le nom du père, which in French means um, the name of the father. If, but in French, le nom du père and le nom du père sound identical, or if you put a better French accent than I do, they sound identical. Um, so Lacan's playing on the words here. So he's trying to capture the idea of the name of the father, which is to indicate this abstraction that he's making. It's not the father. It's not the, the human being. It's not the biological father of the child. He's not insisting on any of those, um, those concrete points. By underscoring the name, he's saying what it is is something symbolic. That's the point. There's something symbolic that intervenes in this relationship between the child and the child's main other, big other, and primary caregiver. But this symbolic something is also um, an interjection. It's also a prohibition. It stops the child's relationship. It stops the child's, it doesn't stop the child's relationship in the sense it says, okay, you, you can never see your mother again. It stops the child's monopoly of that relationship. And what's going on here, according to Lacan, is that the child wants to be it all for the primary caregiver. The child wants to be its everything. And this intervention by another brings the child to the realization that it's not everything for the mother. And for Lacan, that's the important thing that's going on in the Oedipal story. It's not real life mothers and fathers, you know, flesh and blood, um, biological parents. It's about that desire and that intervention in the desire and the child's realization of its place in the world. It wants to be the everything for the mother, which if a child was everything for the mother, if you think about that logically, it's going to be disastrous. If, you know, if a mother has a child and the child is absolutely everything, she doesn't want anything else. She's not going to eat. She's not going to get around. She's not going to exercise. She's not going to socialize with other people. She's just going to focus on the child. It's not going to work. So there has to be something else. And there's something else because the, the nom du père, because of this intervention. And also, thirdly, in a way that kind of really illustrates what's going on here, the desire of the mother. That's the important thing. So it's not what is here that's important. It's the function of what is here. And when we say function, we're talking about the function for the child. So the child's perception of something other that is intervening in this relationship. So that other could be the primary caregiver's job. It could be the TV. It could be uh, the father. It could be a lover. It could be going to the gym. It could be anything that is not the child. Anything that takes that um, primary caregiver, the mother's attention away from the child, is perceived by the child as this intervention, which then creates this triangle, the duality which the child, or we imagine the child would have um, enjoyed initially, is broken by the third point. Oops, something from the order. Um, the Lacan, crucially, this is the, the symbolic element here in the, the name of the father is also the intervention of language. So as this the Oedipal complex is going on, the key thing for Freud that happens at the end of the Oedipal complex is the, the start of repression. So it's the inauguration, the formation of the unconscious. Lacan thinks of this in terms of a movement from being into meaning. He thinks of it in terms of language. So one of the key things Lacan does in relation to Freud is he supplements Freud's theory um, with structural linguistics. So he puts language at the fore. So for Lacan, it's not simply, as it was for Freud, the intervention of people in the child's life. It's very much about the intervention of language. Um, and what the intervention of language does is, for Lacan, it breaks the child in two. It splits the child from itself. So if we conceive of the child in a kind of um, common sense understanding, when a newborn baby is born, it has being. It exists, but it doesn't yet have any language. It doesn't have any ability to manipulate language, to understand language. It simply has um, 
an existence in the world. Um, it's sentient, but it doesn't have language to process things. So it starts off with being without meaning. And a common sense way of thinking of the, the progression from here is that being and meaning start to, um, to join together. Meaning, there is already meaning in the world, um, but the child, um, the child being merges with that. Um, and my slides have gone hor horribly wrong in transition, but um, try going forward one more. Okay. Okay. So that's not what that's supposed to do at all. Okay. Um, let's just move on to the next slide. Let's do it. So, okay, this is a, an easier one to talk to. So, what's going on here for, for Lacan? I put this in, in terms of the mirror stage. Um, again, if you have familiar, familiarity with Lacan, you're probably familiar with the mirror stage. Um, it's one of his key early essays. And it's key to the point I'm talking about in terms of this question of identification. So the mirror stage essentially tells the story of how people come to form a sense of self, how they come to form um, an identity. And crucially for Lacan, that identity is never fixed. So it's not really an identity so much as how they come to form the process of identification. It's an ongoing process of identification. And Lacan's point here is that we don't start off with an identity. So you're not born with an identity. Identity is born through an experience. And that experience for Lacan is an experience um, which can be exemplified, it's not produced to, but it can be exemplified through the idea of a child encountering itself in a mirror. And the point Lacan's really trying to make there is the child is identifying with something exterior to itself. But in very simple terms, it comes to learn what it is through an engagement with the world. In very simple terms, parents take the baby and hold up in the mirror and say, you know, look at yourself in the mirror. This is you. you know, who's a good boy? Who's a good girl? That kind of thing. And through that combination of the visual element and the language that um, accompanies that visual encounter, the child, not in a moment, but over time, starts to develop a sense of what it is in the world. And the kind of is that, that process of development never stops. It's not something that simply happens in childhood. It's something that starts in childhood and then continues throughout your life. It happens more in childhood simply because we start to form identifications and they start to become fixed. Um, but there's always the possibility of those identifications being disrupted, being added to, and we're constantly in this process of identifying positively and negatively with um, things, images, other people um, as we go through our lives. But you have then a kind of double split going on for the child or for the subject, to use the concept. One, you have the split in language, which my horribly wrong slides um, didn't manage to convey. Um, the child is reduced to having to use a language which is necessarily exterior to itself in order to comprehend itself. So for that in simple terms, we all have ideas of who we are, but we have these ideas of who we are in languages which existed long before we existed. So I guess most of you, German speakers, you will have ideas of yourself predominantly in German. The German language didn't come around when you were born. It was around a long time before you were born. So you're using an exterior set of tools to comprehend, to describe, to forge identifications with the things which are supposedly most intimate to you, the core of who you are. The only way you can formulate that is through tools that don't belong to you. And Lacan argues this creates a split in the subject, split between its immediate experience and the only tools it has available to comprehend um, those experiences. The second split is the imagistic split. So the child comes to learn that it, it comes, it's told, this is you, but what the child sees externally doesn't fit with what it experiences Internally. So in terms of the mirror states, the, you know, the very obvious fact here, if you stand in front of a mirror, what you tend to see is the front of your body, and usually from about there up. And you, okay, some people have full-length mirrors, but um, 
you know, most people see themselves in the morning in the bathroom, you're brushing your teeth or shaving, doing your hair. That's what we come to identify with ourselves. Most of us, that's what we will identify ourselves. But you're no more that than you are the back of your head or the sole of your feet or you know, your bits of you that you don't normally see or bits of you that you never see unless you're a hairdresser. So we have these ideas that are external to us. Added to that, what you see in the mirror is necessarily only an exterior. But what you experience immediately of yourself is an interior, arguably primarily an interior, not an exterior. So you feel grumbles, pains, gurgles, strange sensations within your body. None of that is captured in the mirror. And Lacan argues this gives the child the sense that the mirror image is more perfect, more complete, more whole. And that's particularly emphasis by the fact that when he's talking about a child around one year in age, they're not very coordinated. They, you know, they can maybe just stand up on their own. They maybe need something to help them stand up, like holding on to something else. Um, they possibly can, are just learning to walk. Um, but young children don't have that kind of bodily coordination. Arguably, many adults don't have very good bodily coordination. But the image in the mirror seems to be more complete. So there's that disparity between the image experience, bodily experience, and the image that the child comes to identify with. So that imagistic schism put together with the linguistic schism creates this kind of double split in the subject. So two ways in which the child or the becoming subject is divided, is divided from itself. Okay. That's beautiful myth. So just to underscore, the, the point I'm trying to make, and I'm recapping stuff that I imagine many of you already know, but the point I'm trying to make is the move that Lacan um, takes here from the point, the story, the very um, descriptive story, the well-narrated story that Freud gives us, which allows us to imagine what's going on, which puts it in very concrete terms in terms of mothers and fathers and sexual relationships. And Lacan takes it and he abstracts it. He abstracts it into the child, another, and something else that intervenes in that. And through that abstraction, he steps away from reifying points in the theory, which arguably have no real right to be reified. And what I mean by that is when Freud starts his Oedipal complex, he already has some very um, firm ideas in mind. There will be a mother who will be female. There will be a father who will be male. The child will then arrive at one of those two positions themselves. There is no other choice in Freud because we started from the assumption there already is necessarily a male and a female at the beginning. And arguably that model simply doesn't work in the 21st century. We've started to understand the family. And arguably before Freud, it wouldn't have worked. The idea of the, the nuclear family, the, the Victorian family, is not something we see stretched out over history. Um, it's a fairly new invention and it's an invention that um, can be put into question as well. Um, it's not to say it's a, it's a failed model. It's simply not the model that everyone chooses to live by. Therefore, the description that Freud gives us is something that only applies in certain, cer certain circumstances, which is then to say it's not the universal myth that he hoped to have discovered. By abstracting it, Lacan allows us to appreciate the universality within the myth. He takes away these points of imaginary identification and strips things down to a basic logic, which seems to be arguably, I would say, is much more um, understandably universal. The second myth I'm going to talk about is the, the myth of the primal horde. This is another myth of Freud's, and this one properly belongs to Freud, because unlike the myth of Oedipus, which he, he borrowed from Sophocles, the myth of the primal horde, Freud invented himself. And he seemed to have been very proud of himself, inventing his own myth. Um, he liked myths a lot, I guess, to have his own myth was quite a big achievement. And he makes this up, and he makes no bones about the fact he's making this up. He doesn't claim that it ever happened. He doesn't claim that um, it's 
you can discover this myth in um, in Aboriginal societies. He's upfront. He's making this up. He's making this myth up as a way of trying to describe what may have happened or to account for the lack of understanding of what happened at the beginning of society. That's the, the function of the myth. And if you look at Levi Strauss, that's arguably the function of all myths is not to explain so much as to cover over something that can't be explained. We can't account for how society erupts out of non-society, how law erupts um, when there was no law. And that's what Freud's trying to do with the, the myth of the primal court, to kind of explain, or not explain, to, to cover over and, and give a, um, a story that sits in place of this inaugural point of, of culture, of society, of law. So the basis of the story is that there is a, there's a pack or a horde of um, proto-human beings. I was thinking of them as kind of like um, gorillas, you know, kind of silverbacks. And amongst the group, as you get with gorillas, there is one dominant alpha male, Freud refers to as the primal father. And as the dominant alpha male, this primal father has domination over all the women of the tribe. So he has access to all the women and all the other males, the, the non-alpha males, beta males or gamma males, are left without women. They're, they're excluded from this. So he, he, he jealously guards his access to the women and he excludes uh, the band of brothers, as Freud refers to. The band of brothers aren't very happy about this because they want access to the females of the tribe. So they gang together and the only way they can overcome the primal father is by working together to overcome them. Because as the alpha male, he could defeat any of them, but collectively they can overpower them and that's what they do. They overpower, they kill him, get rid of him, so they have access to the females of the tribe. But, so Freud tells us, then they start to feel guilty about what they've done. They experience remorse at having killed the father. So rather than give themselves access to the women of the tribe, the females of the tribe, which is the whole point in the exercise, um, they decide to eat the father, so they have a totem meal where they consume the father, which is Freud's way of trying to kind of get over this point of identification. Um, and this inaugurates society, because what they do is, at the feast of the father, they agree to prohibit access to the women of the tribe in honour of the dead father. And this becomes, Freud, the first law. The first law is the law of incest. So it's a neat story. I say Freud isn't trying to pretend this story ever happened. Um, he's creating a story that tries to account in mythological terms for the existence of the incest prohibition, the inauguration of law, and crucially, this kind of point of identification. Um, how do you get law? You need to have something that stands outside of law in order to, um, in order for law um, to be screwed up. We say in English, it's the exception that proves the rule. You need an exception to a rule for the rule to be a rule. If there are no exceptions to the rule, then it's not a rule. It's simply, you know, um, as Wittgenstein would say, it's, it's nonsense. It's just how things are. You can't say anything meaningful about it. And this then establishes this... Um, this mythical figure, figure of the, the totem father um, who stands outside law and is the guarantor of law as we have it. So again, a little bit like the Oedipus story, Lacan goes back to this, but he does the same thing as he does with the Oedipus story. He strips out the story aspects of it, the kind of the narrative hooks that lead us into the story. And, you know, Freud's myths, Freud's telling of the myths, whether it's Sophocles' myths, he's retelling, um, or the primal horde story, yeah, you know, they're good stories. We can understand them. We can identify with points in them. We can they make sense to us as stories because we're used to hearing stories. They have good beginnings, middles, and ends. Um, they have a point to them. What Lacan wants to do is remove us from that point of easy identification. So he does the same thing as he does with the Oedipal complex. He abstracts it. 
And this time he abstracts it into, um, into abstract, very abstract notation. Um, he produces um, what is usually referred to as the graph of sexuation. Um, and the title here, can I tell you where I'm going with this? this leads back to what I was saying in the beginning. This idea of um, sexuation um, coming to a point of identification with male or female. Um, this is what Freud had been trying to describe through the Oedipal complex. It's also what Freud has been trying to describe in part through the myth of the primal father, because in the myth of the primal father, you have the band of brothers who are the active ones. They're the ones doing something. So they want to have possession of the women. The women play a very um, passive role in the whole story. They don't do anything. They don't turn around and say, whoa, whoa, boys, we don't actually want to be yours. We want to be his. That's why we're with him. They've, they're just kind of mute in the corner while the band of brothers decide that they're going to kill the father and get access to these women. So the women are presented in the story very much as, um, as objects, something to be taken, which gives us these identificatory points. There's the masculine identificatory point in the story, which is the, the active point, albeit one which is ultimately... Um, put in a position of prohibition or put in for his is castrated or at least lives under the threat of castration. But then you have the female position where it is, as I say, just kind of a, um, an inactive, passive position um, over there somewhere. So the males take center stage, the females um, don't. Lacan translates this, and if you press the next one, we should lose the bottom here. I'll come back to the bottom bit because it's slightly distracting. Um, I want to focus primarily on the top part of this graph. What we have at the top here looks like some um, peculiar mathematical formula. Um, it is actually quite straightforward. Lacan is just drawing on formal logical notation. And he, what he's doing is he's taking Freud's myth of the primal horde, and he's essentially reinscribing the myth using formal notation. So again, like the, what he, as he does with the Oedipal complex, he strips out all the points of identification and reduces it to four logical statements. The four logical statements sit in two parts. So we have what he refers to as the male side and what he refers to as the female side. So he's um, where Freud focuses very much on the male, but the females are a necessary part of the story. Lacan is um, equalizing things a little bit more in the sense of giving um, both sides center ground. But he's also, again, like he did with the Oedipal complex, he's taking away that obvious starting point that Freud always starts with, which is there are men and there are women. So what Freud starts with, again, like he does need a complex, is already existing, an already existing binary. There are men, there are women, and he accounts for um, how they come to occupy different places. But he accounts for how they come to occupy different places because they already occupied different places. It's a slightly circular way of telling the story. Lacan's way of, through his abstraction, his way of representing the story seems to me to be less circular, which is one advantage to it. And it doesn't have those points of imaginary identification, which is um, a very productive second advantage to it. So if, I'll just go through what the notations mean <laughs> and have the, the next slides. So as I said, these are, are fairly straightforward. Um, the backwards capital E simply means the existential, which this is a logical notation, which means, um, in simple terms, there exists. There exists one of these. Um, so when Lacan puts it, he puts the, the backwards E, X, meaning there exists one X. The upside down A in logical notation just means all. And the, the phi is just standing in for the, the phallus or the phallic function. And whenever there's a bar above something, it's just a, a negation, an X simply means X. X is just the placeholder, as it is in you know, algebra in high school. Um, 
Okay, so the important points are the existential, there exists, all, the phallic function, and the phallic function here, by phallic function, Lacan's referring to um, the function of castration. That's what the phallic function means for the Lacan. Um, and then we have the negation. So if we go on to the next one, we can see the four statements. So the first statement, actually, I'll start with the second statement. That makes, that makes slightly more sense to start that way around. So the bottom on the your left-hand side um, says all X are subject to the phallic function. That's all it means. So it's quite, really quite straightforward. All X are subject to the phallic function, which means all those on this side of the graph are subject to castration. Now, I'll come back to, what, to the idea of castration shortly, because again, Lacan is abstracting things. So he's not, when he says castration, he's not talking about um, genital mutilation. Um, he's using the term in a much more abstract way. The top half of the left-hand side says there exists one, one X, who is not subject to the phallic function. So you have immediately a fairly straightforward contradiction here. If you just read the terms um, as they are, there exists one who's not subject to the phallic function and all are subject to the phallic function. Those two statements cannot be true, except if you think of it in terms of the myth of the primal horde, that's exactly what Freud has just described. So yes, there's a contradiction, but it's a special kind of contradiction. It's the exception that inaugurates or establishes the rule. And this is kind of the point that's going on for Freud in the story. But what Lagarde is doing is he takes that and he's making it more abstract. He's putting it into abstract terms. So in order for there to be the group who are subject to the phallic function, that wouldn't make any sense if there wasn't at least the possibility of one who is not subject to the phallic function. Because if it's simply the fact that all are subject to the phallic function, then that's just a statement of how things are. It's not a rule. You need something outside to determine the inside. And that's what then is being described. So we can understand it as the inauguration of law, or in Lacanian terms, we'd say the inauguration of the symbolic order. This, as say, Lacan refers to as the, the male side. So the male side is the side where we are in conformity with societal regulations, the symbolic order, and the circulation of society. Um, and that's all made possible because of this instantiation of law by excluding um, the one who is not subject to the function, the idea of um, the male figure who is not castrated, um, who is not, um, who's not vulnerable. Um, the one who actually has the phallus. And again, I'll come to the terms phallus and, and castration in Lacan's abstract use of them um, in a moment. If that's the male side, then what does it say on the female side? The female side, we have um, a double negation on the top, which says there is not one, there doesn't exist one, who is not subject to the phallic function. So that seems very straightforward, yeah? So there is, there is no one on this side who is not subject to the phallic function, which is basically to say there is no female equivalent of the primal father. So if we go back to the Freudian myth, the primal father, there's no primal mother. And we can see that in our cultures as well. There are, you know, if you think, if you've ever been to the Sistine Chapel on the ceiling, you can see you know, the big figure of God um, creating Adam, you know, God is the, the, the quintessential primal father. He is omnipresent, he is omniscient, omnibenevolent. He is, you know, he has no failings, he is lacking nothing. And this is what it would mean for Lacan to be not subject to the phallic function. They say the subject is always divided. The subject is always divided, doubly divided, divided in language and also divided in this um, identification. It's not identical. With itself, whereas God figures um, occupy this other place where they are um, utterly perfect. But there's no female equivalent. There's no, the way it's often put is there's no female role model. Now, 
we can actually start to think of female role models in some cultures. The point that Lacan seems to be making is there's a singularity to the male ideal. So this kind of God figure, um, which you see in many, many different cultures, has a singularity to it. Whereas the female um, equivalent, if you want to put it that way, is always bifurcated. It always occupies two different um, modes. You see those modes... You see these modes most typically in Christianity, or most evidently in Christianity, where say you have God on one side as the male figure, and then on the, the female side, you have this kind of schism between uh, the two Marys, Mary Magdalene and um, Mary, Jesus' mother, the Madonna and the whore. And this is the schism in it. Freud has already theorized this, and this is kind of what Lacan's pointing to. There's no singular figure of identification on the female side. The lower part here um, says there is not one who is subject to the phallic function. So again, we've got this kind of peculiar contradiction going on. There's not one, so there does not exist one who is not subject to, and at the same time, not all are subject to. The interpretation here comes from the way Lacan phrases this in French to say, not all. So if you take it in the same way as you take the male side and say that, you know, there does not exist one who is not subject to that, you know, that seems clear enough. There's no female equivalent of the primal father. But then not all X are subject to the phallic function. That seems to contradict this and posit that something like the primal father on the female side. The interpretation which makes sense of this is that what Lacan is saying here is not there are some who are not, there are some, there are some, there are, in, in saying, sorry, get my words right, in saying not all, he's not saying not all individual cases, he's saying not all of any one case, which is to say, you can put it in slightly clearer English terms, we have the top line saying there does not exist one who is not subject to the phallic function, but all on this side are not completely subject to the phallic function. They're not all subject to the phallic function, not entirely subject to the phallic function. So you end up with two, um, the two different sides being oddly asymmetric. And this is what I, I meant in the, the blurb of the, the talk when I talked about um, Lacan's binary. This is Lacan's binary. We talk about binaries. It's, it's the talk of the moment, um, gender binaries, sexual binaries. This is Lacan's version of the binary, but it's not a binary that's reducible to that common use of the term binary when we talk about gender binaries, which is very much like the Freudian version already assuming certain positions. Lacan, by abstracting this, takes that away. And there's no symmetry between the two binaries here. So it's not, um, it's not like a yin-yang, where you can say we can split things into this side and that side, and they somehow complement each other. What you have is two completely um, unrelatable binaries. And Lacan goes on to say there is no relation between the sexes, no relation no way of uh, writing the relation between the two sides here. Which kind of brings us to the lower half. I'll touch on the lower half very briefly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the lower half of the graph is when Lacan talks about sexual relation. Um, oops, sorry. Um, so here we have um, La the female scored out, which is Lacan's notation. In the, in the seminar when he's discussing this, he goes on to describe it, contextualize it. So what we're talking about here is this notorious statement. He says, the woman doesn't exist. And he puts a, the, the la or the the superteur under erasure. Um, what he means by that is the point I was trying to make. There isn't a singular female equivalent of the, the masculine ideal. So the male subject, he argues, um, relates not to the female who doesn't exist in this um, 
ideal form, but to an imaginary version of the female. This goes back to the Kant's um, idea of um, misrecognition and, and how we relate to each other. So the male subject is always relating to an imaginary version rather than the real female. The female, on the other hand, always has this bifurcated um, position. So it's split between these, these two positions because there is no um, ideal for her to identify with, again, no primal father for her to identify with. We can, I'm not, again, there's something slightly heteronormative in this, you know, I'm accusing Freud of heteronormativity, but there's something slightly heteronormative in what Lacan's doing here as well. And I think to be reasonable, we have to understand that um, both Freud and Lacan are writing in a very different age from the age in which we live. So they are, um, even though Lacan is trying to abstract things, make things more um, understandably universal by extracting them and taking them away from these points of imaginary identification. I think there is still a point of um, where, where he slips into his societal norms. So in describing the relation between the sexes here, this does seem to imply that everyone exists in some kind of heterosexual relationship, except for one important caveat. We can, we can, Go again. Go, no. Okay, go back. Go back. Okay, just leave. That's fine. Um, when Lacan's talking about the formulas here, although at points he refers to this as the male side and this as the female side, he also makes the point that you can be male on this side or female on this side, that you can find yourself on either side. And that's a kind of crucial point that I want to get to, because if we move away from the, dis the description, which Lacan himself does use, of the male side and the female side, which seems to be back to this kind of Freudian notion that you start already with an assumption of what the sexual positions are. If you take that away, then you end up with something um, arguably a lot more liberating. Lacan uses terms like phallus, the phallic function, castration. It seems to put things back into this um, received notion of sexual position, sexual positions of sexual identity. Um, it seems to evoke an idea of the biological body, the physical body. But Lacan is very keen to point out all the time that when he says phallus, he's not talking about the biological phallus. He's not talking about the penis. He's using the term phallus as a symbolic term. So he doesn't mean, he's very clear, that he doesn't mean this. But that raises the question, why use that term? Now, I think there's, there's, a, lot of, um, there's a lot of arguments to be made there about why you might use that term. And there's some very good reasons to use that term. Freud's... Lacan a little bit less, but he's not immune to this. It's, but Freud even more so is accused of um, phallocentrism that he, you know, and I kind of indicated this when I was talking about the Oedipal complex, he puts the male position first. He talks about the, the primal horde. He puts the male position first, but the female um, is secondary. But what Freud is also doing through that is identifying that that's how society operates. So you could perhaps being um, generous to Freud, I'm not sure, you could argue that what Freud's doing is actually being anti-phallocentric by pointing out how the phallus works in society. And by carrying on the use of the term phallus, this is what Lacan, we could argue, um, is also doing. He's emphasizing how things are, not how things must be or how things naturally are, but how things are in the society as we live. So by using the term phallus and emphasizing the symbolic dimension of that, that it's a word, it's not a biological uh, thing, it's not a piece of flesh, it's a word. He's emphasizing that symbolic dimension of it. He's not hiding it. He's not saying, okay, well, we're never going to use the term phallus again. We're going to move on and invent new terms for things and create a neutrality because you can't simply wish things away. After centuries of treating things in this way, it's how things are. 
It's not how things necessarily naturally are, and this is the point Lacan's trying to make, that these things are arise through cultures, but it is inscribed. And by inscribing it and insisting on the inscription, but removing the connection or insisting on a lack of connection to the biological body part, Lacan is able to do two things at once. He's able to maintain the description of how society is, but pull things away from the naturalization um, that would allow us to start to keep thinking that's how things must be. So we end up then with this idea of we have the kind of symbolic idea of the phallus, then the idea of castration for Lacan refers to this activity of language. And this gets over some of the problems that Freud had in terms of accommodating both the male and female side, because coming into language is something that happens to all of us. It's not an exclusively male thing. Um, it's not something that could be perceived as having already happened to females because they don't have penises, um, which is kind of the story that Freud sets up. By thinking of castration as a lack that's created through the movement of being into meaning and the gap in meaning that persists then because the child experiences it in a language itself in a language and um, which is alien to it, that schism that that creates within that child, that division, that barring of the subject from itself is what Lacan means by castration. So the phallic function is the, the phallus is the, the assumption that there is something that would make us whole. The one who is whole, the one who still has the phallus is the primal father, God, one who is absolutely complete. We are incomplete. So if you're on this side within society, then you are necessarily incomplete. You're necessarily incomplete because you've come to be in language. And if you've come to be in language, then you cannot be self-identical. But Lacan is also then arguing that there is another possibility, another point of identification here. We don't have to identify on this side. And this, for Lacan, is what creates the possibility of two sexual positions. Oops. We can accept our position as castrated and be within society, or we can push against it. We can not entirely accept it. We can't entirely not accept it because to entirely not accept it would be to, to be out with language, but we can not entirely accept it. And this is what Lacan argues is the female position. The female position is not entirely within the symbolic. It's not without the symbolic, but it's not entirely within the symbolic, which creates this kind of, um, this opening on the symbolic and an opening onto something um, potentially other than the trap of the symbolic order, which allows us then to understand why so many feminists seized on seized hold of Lacan or Lacanian theory. Because he seems to be offering here a way of conceiving the feminine position as a much more productive position than the male position. As we saw in Freud, the feminine position is just kind of quiet over there you know, being ready to be taken by whoever decides they want to um, take possession of you. Lacan's version opens things up. The male position, in a sense, is the dead position. The male is the obsessional, who goes to work, comes home, goes to work, comes home, goes to work, comes home, then eventually has a heart attack. Um, there is nothing to do. The male position keeps society functioning in that way by going round and round and round in circles. The opening on the female position, the fact that it's not constrained with the symbolic order, creates the possibility of something other. So it's very much on this side that Lacan is um, positing the positive. Okay, final myth. Um, I don't know how we're doing for time. Okay, thank you. Um, the final myth is Antigone. Antigone is... Antigone... I imagine you already know, um, is really part of the Oedipus myth. If you go back to Sophocles, um, the Theban trilogy, um, Oedipus Rex, Oedipus at Colonus, and 
um, Antigone form the, the Theban trilogy. Antigone was Oedipus's daughter. So the daughter of Oedipus and Jocasta, who Jocasta is Oedipus's wife and mother. Um, so Antigone is his daughter and his sister simultaneously. Um, at the end of Oedipus Rex, when Oedipus realizes what he's done, he, he tears out his own eyes. He doesn't kill himself, which would be kind of the norm with Greek tragedy, but he, he decides or accepts to continue to live, but he blinds himself. And the kind of obvious interpretation of that is um, this kind of the inauguration of repression. He blinds himself so he can't see what he's done. He doesn't want to see the fruits of his, his awful sin. He's then banished from the city of Thebes. And of all his children or siblings, the one who sticks with him is Antigone. And um, the second play in the, in the trilogy um, is Antigone and Oedipus um, wandering, um, wandering Greece. Um, and she, she goes with him, she looks after him, she's blind, he's old, um, she cares for him. Once Oedipus is, is dead, we get to the third book of the trilogy, it's the one named for Antigone herself. And it essentially follows, um, there's an agreement in place um, after Oedipus dies um, over who will rule the city of Thebes. And it's um, Antigone's two brothers um, who are bequeathed the city, but they're supposed to rule it in turn. So they take, I can't remember exactly how many years each, but a couple of years, one will rule it and then they pass the threat through into the other and then they keep alternating this way. Um, but one of the brothers decides he doesn't want to um, continue giving the, the crown back to his brother and they end up in this kind of sibling rivalry, civil war, um, which culminates in them both killing each other. Um, the brother who Antigone's uncle ultimately sides with um, is given a state funeral. The other brother, the one who's seen as the um, by Antigone's uncle, the now king, as um, the one who has committed a crime, is refused the state funeral. And there's something of a lottery, which I mean, he could have gone either way in this, I think. It's the fact that he has to choose between the two brothers. So he gives one a state funeral and the other he leaves to rot outside the city. Antigone refuses this edict. And although you know, the king has said, we're leaving him outside the city, she says, oh, no, I'm not. I'm going to go and bury him. And she goes and she starts to put dust and gravel and sand over him to bury him. Um, and this is basically the kind of the, the narrative um, of the play. She has contravened um, Creon, the king's uh, edict. And this is described in the play in terms of, and is often taken by theorists subsequent to this, as exemplifying two different um, ethical positions or two different moral positions. Um, Creon is the king. He's giving the rule of the land. He's saying, this is the law. This is, this is how we maintain order. That seems to be what's behind his decision. We have to give one brother a funeral and we have to leave the other. There has to be a punishment. How do you punish the dead? You can't punish the dead other than by treating them as um, something less than human. You just leave them to rot. And Antigone, rather than recognize the rule of law, appeals to what she refers to as the unwritten laws. And this is where ethical theorists have often come in and debated, what does this mean? How do we understand this? There is one interpretation that what she's talking about is family law. So you have this idea of state law versus family law, which says unwritten law. This also understood as that an opposition that we might draw between morality as something that is, um, is written or is understood, is passed down within society, is etched in stone, like our morality and Judeo-Christian societies is, as opposed to a form of ethics which is subjectively driven. Now, we can understand this in possibly slightly simpler terms as the opposition between law and ethics itself, in the sense that 
there is no law that can tell you that you have to obey the law. Yeah, the law tells you what you have to do, but there is always a choice that each of us face in relation to that. Doesn't matter what the law is, any rule in order to be enacted requires the supplement of a choice to enact that rule. So if we are and take a contemporary example, we're told to wear face masks on the train. Yeah, You can choose not to wear a face mask on the train. The fact that the law is, the rule is you have to wear a face mask doesn't mean everyone is going to. It means that's the law. But then everyone makes a choice whether they do or not. Now, that might be a very simple choice of I'm just going to follow the rules. I don't really want to think about it. Or someone might make a principal decision to do other than the law. That's the basic opposition between ethics and the law. It's not that there's a line between them. This thing is the law and this thing is ethics. The one is bound up within the other. Um, and this kind of goes back to Freud's myth of the primal whore. This is the inauguration of law. The inauguration of law has to contain its own impossibility. The impossibility of law is the fact that ethics is required at every step in order for the law to become something actualized. Without the ethical choices that we make, whatever direction we're making them in, law is simply a collection of words. It doesn't actually do anything at all. It requires human interaction to do something. And that human interaction, arguably, is the ethical moment. Lacan, in commenting on Antigone, draws our attention to a particular word that's used in Sophocles' play where the chorus in the play refers to Antigone as, um, as omos. Omos in Greek means raw. And the connotation Lacan's, it's, uh, Lacan says here, it's, it talks about it being uncivilized, um, inflexible, inflexible. And so, so there is, some people have interpreted this as meaning, you know, she simply won't do what she's told. Antigone is a, she's a difficult woman and she won't behave herself. But Lacan's drawing her attention to an idea that's contained within this word, homos, which is relates to the work of his friend, Claude Levi Strauss, who I referred to earlier, a um, great uh, writer on myth. Levi Strauss famously wrote a book, The Raw and the Cooks, and he's talking there about you know, the way of categorizing um, primitive societies, a movement within primitive societies. So in Levi Strauss's term, to say something is raw is to say that it's outside of culture. That's how Levi Strauss distinguishes this. So, so in terms of food, a food that is cooked doesn't mean it's heated. It means it's been prepared in some way. That's the way that he uses to distinguish some societies that um, the movement into culture, so the becoming of society. Um, Levi Strauss argues this in the sense that we, we change our relationship to food. So when Lacan evokes the idea of almost here and relates it to the uh, this translate, translated into this, this idea of the raw, this is what he's trying to refer to, that Antigone exists outside of culture, outside of society. So when she appeals to the unwritten laws, when she appeals to an ethical drive as opposed to the law itself. What she's doing is she's positioning herself outside of culture, outside of society, which is to say she's positioning herself on this side of the diagram. She is not all within the symbolic order. And Antigone in Lacan's writing, not only in Lacan's writing, but for a context, in the plans writing is held up as this exemplary figure in terms of ethics. And the point I'm trying to make ultimately is we put these myths together and we come to an understanding here that we have a new way through the Khan of understanding the sexual positions that we can adopt in society rather than rely on preconceived or received notions of there are male and female positions derived variously from biology to parental identification to 
hormones to reproductive capacity, all of these things which may or may not have bearing on various facets of life. And if you can stop to ask yourself, at what point in your social functioning, your relationships with other people, does reproductive capacity actually bear any relevance? Um, the answer is probably not actually that often. Rather than simply move to a position where we say, okay, let's forget the whole thing, Lacan, like Freud before him, is being realistic and saying, we can't dispense with the idea of this division, but we can change how we conceive of the division. The function of the phallus exists in our society, but if we strip away the points of identification and the insistence and articulation of this to the existence or non-existence of certain body parts and actually start to think of the symbolic function that these ideas rather than the body parts have within our society, then we end up with a choice between two positions. We end up between the choice between being within the law or being wrong. And the question I'm kind of seeking to pursue is what is the potential. There seems to be a, a strong ethical, political potential in this side and this option. Open them up. The raw. Stop there.